So do we talk about Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our session during the Wildlife Week. Uh, just today we're going to be talking about uh, ex situ and in situ conservation linkages, which basically means how zoos are contributing to wildlife conservation in the field. So uh, we have our speakers today. Uh, we have Soha Mukherjee and Phoebe Griffith, both working with crocodilians. Uh, especially for Bharyal in India and Nepal. Uh, but we'll start off the session with a little bit of Central Zoo Authority, uh, the body which regulates and monitors zoos in India. And I'm going to invite Dr. Devendra Kumar to uh, give us a brief about the CZA. Thank you, ma'am. I once again welcome you all to this. Uh, Dr. Devendra, you're on mute, sir. Okay, sir. Hello. So, yes. welcome you all again. And uh, uh, just for your introduction, this is the second day activity scheduled under Wildlife Week celebration uh, 2020 by the Central Zoo Authority. And yesterday we have very good uh, session under the uh, chairmanship of uh, Honorable Minister for Environment, Forest and Climate Change. And uh, that is for distribution of... Uh, uh, awards uh, under the recognition of uh, uh, zoo staff. Uh, the award is uh, presented uh, in four categories for zoo director and veterinarian, zoo education, educationist or biologist, and zoo keepers. So uh, this is the second day activity, and uh, uh, we are talking about the conservation and breeding of the endangered species, uh, Gadial as a case study. And uh, uh, I just uh, just introducing about the Central Zoo Authority. Uh, uh, next slide, please. The Central Zoo Authority is basically a statutory body under the Ministry of Environment, uh, Forest and Climate Change. Uh, as you might be aware that uh, in the 19th century and early 20th century is the uh, era of mushrooming of ill-conceived and ill-managed Jews. So the government of India felt that uh, there should be a central agency or zoo grant commission, uh, which can regulate uh, such kind of uh, mushrooming of the zoos and can maintain uh, uh, can maintain or come with uh, uh, standard um, raising existing standards of animal upkeep and veterinary care in zoos in India. So the Central Zoo Authority was uh, uh, created, established by enacting chapter 4 under section 38a to 38j of the wildlife protection act 1972 in the february 1992 as on to um, basically the central zoo authority was created as a regulator in the um, earlier uh, 90s but now it is uh, playing the role in case of white trumped indian and central build and we have 100 plus individual in our uh, captivity uh, that are also ready for release uh, in the wild. Similarly, we have already released Indian Shepherdine mouse deer uh, in at three different locations in the state of Telangana, and their post monitoring is being continuously uh, done, and they are doing well in the uh, in all three sites. Similarly, uh, there are 25 uh, individual of one greater one horned rhinoceros in. Uh, in the captivity and Padna Zoo is uh, really doing well in the conservation breeding of this species. And in the past, we have uh, released Red Panda, Indian Shavatin, Cheer Fijant, and recently Western Tragopan were also released in Himachal Pradesh. And similarly, Ghadiyal were, uh, were also released in the uh, wild successfully. Next, please. And uh, 
all the objectives of conservation bidding and uh, linking X to in situ can be achieved by um, integrating species recovery plan for uh, all threatened native species and uh, restore and secure self-sustaining wild populations. Capacity building is also very important, uh, right from zookeeper to the managers, uh, both at national and international level. And uh, funding support, uh, support is also very, very important for taking up any conservation bidding program. And participation in international ex to conservation program is also helpful in getting uh, the success. And NGOs and other experts are, can also be um, intro means uh, consultative can, uh, can be collaborate with to get the success. So thank you. Uh, once again, I welcome you all to this session. And now I would request Dr. Gauri Mallapur to say a few facts about the reptiles. He's expert on reptile. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Dr. Devinder. Okay, so um, the reason we're having this session today is because uh, we wanted to specifically talk about crocodiles. It's a slightly unrepresented uh, species when we talk about uh, conservation breeding programs. But the CZA is now looking into introducing more reptiles into the organized breeding uh, conservation breeding program. So we'll start with uh, just a brief about the crocodiles and the reason for uh, specific conservation breeding programs that are currently being run in situ in the wild is because crocodiles were originally hunted to extinction mainly for their skin. But when the Wildlife Protection Act came into play in the year 1972, India uh, took cognizance of the decreasing numbers of these uh, crocodilians and protected all three species that we have in India, the magar, the saltwater crocodile and the gharial, uh, under the Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act. So here we see the magar and the saltwater crocodile and this is uh, the beautiful and enigm enigmatic gharial that you're going to hear about today when we're uh, when the sessions uh, start and uh, this is uh, in addition to the crocodiles the uh, conservation breeding programs to start assurance colonies would possibly be done even for um, critically endangered turtle species that we have in our country. And a lot of these species are sympatric. They share habitats and therefore a marriage between the ex situ conservation programs and the in situ conservation programs would be very valuable. With this in mind, uh, our session today would sort of demonstrate how this has already uh, started being implemented in the field. And for this, I think I'm going to invite uh, PB, PB Griffith, who is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Oxford and is a part of the Zoological Society of London. Uh, she's a passionate crocodile conservationist and zoologist and is conducting research on the Dharyal in Nepal. And uh, she's looking to uh, inform with evidence based research on the conservation of this evolutionarily unique and uh, what some people would possibly call weird looking critically endangered crocodile. Um, Phoebe, um, I'm going to share your screen and you could possibly start your talk. Thank you very much everyone for taking the time to attend this. <laughs> Okay. Oh, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gary, for that kind introduction and Dr. Devender. I'm very excited to be here speaking to you all today. Um, I'm now going to hopefully share my screen with you all. Okay, awesome. Who stole the fish from the cookie jar? Um, so my name's Phoebe, and as said, I um, 
and with the Zoological Society of London and University of Oxford conducting my PhD currently in gurial conservation in Nepal. Um, so this is the wonderful gurial. Um, this is a young one in at the captive rearing centre in Chitwan in Nepal where I'm based. Um, so I'll start off with a little bit of introduction about gurial. So um, kind of my big question when I was a child was, why are they so weird looking? Um, so many of the other crocs and alligators uh, look quite similar, but the gurial have this really long, thin snout. And that's because they're adapted for um, eating aquatic creatures, mostly fish. So gurial actually start catching fish at just a couple of weeks old. This uh, gurial in the photo here was just um, about two weeks old when it started catching fish. Um, but they will also take uh, any other aquatic creature that's small enough to get in their jaws. So this photo was taken on the Chumbal in India by gurial tracker Pankaj Kumar, and it shows um, a large adult male gurial crunching down on a turtle. So it's not just fish that they'll go in for, um, but it's always aquatic creatures. So unlike other crocs, they don't uh, attack livestock or people. Um, the other question about gurial is, what is the strange lump on the end of their snout? Um, so it's called the gara, and that's where the, the name of the gurial comes from, named after the gara. And they... Um, this is only found on the snout of the adult male. So the females and the young animals don't have it. And then when the males start to mature at about four meters in size, they start to grow this gar on the end of their nose and it grows long, uh, bigger and bigger throughout their life as they get longer and longer. And uh, Jai is a PhD student with the Gurriel Ecology Project, and he's been investigating Gurriel acoustic communication. So Gurriel uh, talking to each other, and he's found that the males with this gara can make a really unique noise that he's called a pop. Um, so a pop is a really loud noise, kind of like a, a, a bottle of fizzy, um, of a fizzy drink being uncorked, but you can hear it over a kilometre away. And only the males with the gara can make this strange noise. And they use it for all sorts of communication, including flirting, fighting, talking to their babies. Um, so that seems to be what this strange lump is all about. And the gurriel is the only species that has this gara. Um, the other thing I love about gurriel is they can get so big. So in fact, males can grow over six meters long. And um, this is a photo taken from a drone also on the Chumbal, and it just shows this huge male and this stick is a meter long. So you can see just how big they get. And in fact, this is a baby. So it shows how much growing they've got to do when they hatch out of the eggs because they start off this small and end up absolutely massive. Um, the, th the other awesome thing about Gurriel is they are fantastic parents. So they're wonder mums and super dads. Um, this is our wonder mum from the field site I work at in Nepal. Uh, we call her Gurriel 18 because that's her tag. Um, and she looks after the babies of all the females that nest together in this one particular area. So because the population is quite small in uh, Nepal, um, she usually looks after the babies of about 10 females who all nest together. However, in some of the bigger populations, such as on the Chumbal River in India, um, huge numbers of females lay their nests all together and there you get super dads. So these uh, adult males will look after the babies, all the females who've laid in a single area and you can get one male looking after a crash of literally thousands of hatchlings. Um, so they're absolutely fantastic parents. Um, although they're not necessarily always the dad in this case, they might be a male who's moved to the area later um, or they may be uh, a young male who hasn't bred yet, who's possibly trying to sort of build up a reputation as a good father. So maybe he'll get more matings in the future. Um, but we don't see that so much in Nepal. We mostly see the females looking after the babies. Um, but this shows just how many babies one male might look after. So um, this incredible amount of small hatchlings. And the reason this is important is because baby gurriel are little tiny things and they're absolutely delicious to so many other creatures that live in the rivers. 
So the parents look after them to keep them safe from different predators. Um, so this is, for example, is a stork, which is a, um, is a predator of the baby gurriel. And the adult females and males will make sure that they stay away from the babies. So this is a really critical period in which the gurriels will care for their young. Um, and this is um, one of our camera trap videos from Nepal. Um, oh, not sure it's... Oh, it's not going to work. But what we can see in it is there's a tiger is walking along the beach. And as the tiger walks along the beach, you can see the adult female gurriel just squaring up to it, following it along the beach, keeping an eye on the tiger because she's continually wanting to protect her babies. Um, and the sad thing about the gurriel, however, is that they're critically endangered, which means they're at imminent risk of extinction. And we can see in this map, these are the places where gurriel are found today. So they're just in 14 small isolated populations throughout Nepal and India. Whereas previously, about 70 years ago, they were found all the way from Pakistan through as far as Myanmar in the east and all the rivers in the middle. And then as Dr. Gary said at the beginning, along with the other croc species, they really decreased in the 60s and 70s because of hunting and habitat loss. Um, and now they're left in just these few isolated locations. And the fact that they survived at all is because of awesome conservation work that started in the 70s and continues to this day. Um, so, um, so in Nepal in particular, the, the big reasons they declined was the building of dams and barrages. So after a dam or a barrage is built on the river, that really changes the whole hydrology and habitat of the river. And sadly, when that happens, the gurial populations usually collapse very soon after. Um, so following big declines after the building of these dams, there are some other threats that also push the numbers down, including hunting, although that doesn't occur anymore because they're a protected species. Um, this is when they get entangled in fishing nets. So this continues to be a big problem, especially where I am in Nepal, is there's a type of net called a gill net and the gurriel get tangled up in it. And sometimes they drown, sometimes they break free, but it gets tangled on their snouts and then they can't eat. And sometimes um, in order to get them out the nets, fishermen sometimes chop their snout off or sometimes kill them to get them out the net. This is a really big pro problem, especially because populations are struggling to recover because of these dams in the rivers. And a new and emerging threat is sand and gravel mining. So um, this is for the construction industry, and it's an increasing in, uh, industry throughout Asia and um, the rest of the world. And what uh, happens is people are taking the sand from the riverbanks because it's really good for building uh, concrete and glass. And this takes away the habitat of the gurriel, and they really need this sand in order to lay their eggs and for basking. Um, so this is where I'm based for my PhD. This is down in the south of Nepal uh, on the Indian border. And then the river continues down into India and eventually forms part of the Ganges. Uh, where I work is called Chitwan National Park. And it's actually famous for some of the bigger species that live in the rest of the park. So these are some photos I've taken from the gurriel nesting site. So we find tigers, rhinos, and elephants, um, which are always very exciting. Um, so what uh, happened in, uh, the 1960s and 70s, after the gurriel population has really declined, is the government of Nepal decided to establish the Gurriel Conservation Breeding Centre um, with the aim of both breeding and collecting in eggs from the wild and rearing them up in captivity to supplement the wild population. So this is the adult male at the centre today. And what happens is mostly the eggs collected from the wild are reared up in captivity, safe from predators, until they're about 1.5 meters long. So the idea is at that size, they're so big, they're safe from being eaten by predators, and they have a much better chance of surviving to adulthood in the wild. And once a year when they reach that size in about March, they're then taken out to the river in these specially designed crop boxes, and they're then released out into these elephant grass enclosures as a, it's called a soft release. So it helps the gurriel get used to being in the main river. And then after a few days or sometimes a few weeks, they push out through these enclosures and they then join the river and part of the population. Um, 
And we saw that this was really important for preventing the gurriel going extinct in Nepal. Um, however, for some reason, and that's what I'm investigating at the moment, the population didn't actually start to recover for a long time. Um, so for about 25 years, the population still continued to slowly decline, but a small number of the gurriel that were released were making it up to adult size and joining the population. And then over the last 10 years, we've started to see the population in Nepal really increasing um, to about 200 individuals today, which is very exciting. Not only that, but the population uh, on the Ganda just south is also increasing. Um, so together, this is really good news. And in fact, this is an adult female who was from the breeding center, released into the wild. And here she is 10 years later, um, having uh, laid eggs. So that's really exciting. Um, so she successfully bred this year. Um, but even accounting for, um, when you account for all the gurriel that were released from the breeding center, um, only about 30% have joined the population in Nepal. So a big question that everyone had was, what was happening to 70 plus percent of gurriel after they were released? And that's the question I'm trying to answer. So here I am with um, Chief Conservation, uh, Assistant Conservation Officer Beb Bahada Kugka and Aitran Bote at the breeding center. And what we're doing is we're attaching a tag onto the tail of a gurriel before we release it from captivity. And this is a radio tag that's going to allow us to follow up that gurriel for two years so we can see exactly what happens to it. So here you can see it's just a little tag just on the tail. And we also put these colored orange tags on here so we can, um, that's also helpful for seeing the gurriel even if we don't have the tracking equipment with us. And then what we have to do next is two years of going up and down the river, checking for the signal from those gurriel. And so this is an antenna here that picks up the signal from that tag. Here I am with my colleague Ranjana and we are tracking the gurriel to see exactly where they are and what's happened to them. And in fact, this is Prakash who does most of the tracking and he's in fact out tracking gurriel today. And um, together we've found um, all the gurriel and we've managed to keep tabs on them for the whole duration of battery life. There's just a few months left before we're expecting to lose the battery life. And this shows the sort of environment that the rivers are in. So the rivers are thro flowing through this jungle and this kind of grassland as well. And this map shows where the gurriel went. So of the 20 we tagged um, and released where this red dot is, most of them went initially downstream um, with a couple then moving upstream when they reached the bigger river. And one, um, in fact, went way upstream straight after release. Um, unfortunately, we found that just a year after release, a quarter of them had already died. Mostly this was because of getting caught up in fishing nets and drowning. Um, and one or two, it was because they struggled to adapt after being released from captivity and just showed some really strange behaviors. Um, what was, however, exciting was we were, um, with the help of the Wildlife Trusts of India, we were able to track what was happening to some gurriel who disappeared from Nepal. And this one showed up over the border in India, having gone downstream through the dam um, and is now living just downstream on the border and has joined the population there. So that's really exciting. Um, another unusual story was earlier this year, one who was released um, up here with this red dot in Chitwan was found just 60 days later in the Huli in West Bengal. And this gurriel was able to be identified because the, uh, although it didn't have a tag on, the tail had been clipped in a way that made it identifiable. So we find that very occasionally, some of these gurriel are traveling huge distances downstream after they're being released. But most of them are in fact staying in Nepal and some of those threats are still continuing and stopping that population recovering. Um, and so because of that, we can see that saving gurriel means we have to save gurriel habitat and protect rivers for sustainable use by people and also to make them safe homes for gurriel and other species that need the river. So, but some big questions we had were exactly how much river do gurriel need to be protected? And also what parts of the river system do gurriel use? We know that they mostly use the main river channels but in the monsoon, they spend most of their time underwater and we weren't really sure where they were going. 
So this meant that we decided we had to catch and tag some wild gurriel. So here's the awesome team I work with in Nepal. Um, they're all from the indigenous Bote and Maji communities in Chitwan. And they're really experienced um, with working with gurriel. And we caught the gurriel in the wild in the nets, um, as you can see in this picture here. Um, so this is kind of an action shot of the whole process. So we would set a long net alongside uh, the riverbank. And then when the gurriel went down, hopefully they would just go straight into that net and we can immediately take them out of the river. However, occasionally they didn't, in which case the team here are really experienced with throw nets. So they'd throw the net over the gurriel and then bring it into shore. However, the wild gurriel in Nepal have lived so long because they're really good at avoiding getting caught in nets. So actually we tried to catch this female a couple of times and every time she got away, because the second she saw the net set in the water, she would go over the top. And then when she saw the team here turning up with throw nets, she took one look at them and dove right to the bottom of the river. So we didn't actually manage to catch the gurriel in this picture. Um, but after we did catch the gurriel, um, then we would restrain them. What you can see in this picture here is you put pressure on the back of the gurriel keep them held down. This is um, Soham is here, who is showing us sort of best practice for this. Um, he will be speaking next. Um, and we then um, we tied the gurriel up and covered them in damp sacks and kept them blindfolded because it was really important um, to um, consider the gurriel welfare and also the safety of all the team at the same time. And after the gurriel was restrained, um, we would put some tags on their tail. So this is an adult female, so she was able to have two tags, one for manual tracking, like I talked with before, going up and down the river with the antenna. And this is a GPS tag, so that's really easy. It just connects to the mobile network and tells us exactly where the gurriel is four times a day. Um, as soon as the tags were on, we would then release the gurriel straight back into the river where we caught them so they could carry on with their day. So here we are with the team just about to release this uh, sub-adult male gurriel. It's one of only two gur uh, male gurriel we tagged, so he's really important to us. Um, and what have we found? Well, we found that the gurriel use a lot of river. So the adult females in particular will travel big distances um, for different reasons. So this was one female who was caught up here. She then went 40 kilometers downstream, right down to near the border to mate and lay her nest. Then after she'd finished crash guarding down here, she came all the way back upstream to spend the monsoon catching fish back in this river. So she needed all this space of river um, protected to look after her. And this was her just after we tagged her going back into the river. Uh, we also found that during the monsoon, a lot of the gurriel were leaving the protected areas. So what we can see here is grassland and protected forest right next to agricultural land and the river flows between the two. And we found that in the monsoon, lots of gurriel, especially ones between about two and three meters, were leaving this main river and going way up into the small rivers through the agricultural areas where they're not as well protected. And also people don't know they're there. So they don't, um, you know, people don't know they're there then they're not able to protect them. And so they were sometimes getting accidentally killed. Um, so what this information has shown us is uh, exactly where the gurriel are through the year. So now everyone can engage with the community in order to have community-led gurriel conservation, um, which has worked well in the past um, in Chitwan for lots of different species. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to all the partners I work with who make this project possible um, and to everyone who's given us um, financial and logistical support. Um, and yeah, I'll finish with my final thought, which is if we protect uh, rivers, we can save gurriel. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Phoebe. That was an amazing talk. And it's actually inspired me. And I'm hoping to come and see you in Nepal and see the wonderful Gharial with you someday. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Devendra to introduce our next speaker, uh, Soham Mukherjee. Dr. Devendra? Yeah, yeah. Okay.
मोहम मुखर्जी घड़ियाल इकोलॉजी परियोजना राष्ट्रीय चंबल अभ्यारण्य उत्तर प्रदेश भारत के साथ काम करते हैं तो हम को विभिन्न मगरमच्छ प्रजातियों के साथ काम करने का एक दशक से भी अधिक का अनुभव है उन्हें मगरमच्छ प्रजातियों से संबंधित व्यवहार और पर्यावरण संबंधन संवर्धन में विशेष रुचि है और कई वर्षों से चंबल में घड़ियाल पारिस्थितिक परियोजना क्षेत्र में काम से जुड़े हैं ओवर टू सो हम प्लीज Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, shall I uh, share my screen? Yeah, yeah, yes, please. Okay. Uh, hope everyone can see that. All right. <clears throat> So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm essentially going to talk about the ex situ and in situ conservation linkages. Uh, and thank you, Phoebe, for your excellent presentation. Uh, it was really nice to, you know, get a refresher of uh, uh, what's happened and what's been happening. And it is also important to learn how uh, these projects work in the because a lot of times we don't get to know the uh, actual steps that are uh, taken in the field and you know a lot of people end up being uh, you know just clueless because they're only looking at uh, the results but the hard work is really really something that uh, everyone should know about so let's go ahead with uh, uh, this particular session uh, wherein i'll try to discuss mostly on the ex situ and in situ conservation linkages, which is very, very important, with, uh, of course, uh, a case study which uh, includes our uh, species of concern today, which is the Gharial. Now, of course, we know that India has three species of crocodilians uh, the saltwater crocodile, which is uh, the largest crocodilian species in the world, uh, the mugger, which is uh, the most widespread and also most abundant uh, in India. Uh, in fact, there are some places where uh, they have been living so closely with the uh, human population that a lot of people have been terming them as, uh, you know, very close to pests because they are living in the same river system that goes through uh, major water bodies through cities, like, for example, in the city of Vadodara. Uh, these are the places where uh, human crop conflicts are also at a rise and... Uh, essentially they are because of you know lack of understanding of uh crocodilian biology how to live with uh, uh, dangerous animals that share your space your habitat uh, resources that you've been using and all of that so that's also something that uh, happens a lot in india uh the third species of course is our karyal uh karyal happens to be still uh on the list high up with the other species of crocodilians as critically endangered and there has been a more recent assessment uh, of the species it still maintains its, its uh, critically critically endangered status uh, with IUCN along with several other species but for India if you look at uh, Gharials it is of immense importance because India is one of the last perhaps most viable uh, sort of habitats left for gharials because as Phoebe also mentioned gharials live in large water bodies that are you know not uh, broken by barrages and uh, by dams they need they require the long stretches of rivers in fact uh, during one of the projects uh, with the radio telemetry it was discovered that you know some females travel as far as 200 kilometers or more from uh, one end like two extremes of the river uh, from one end to the other in different uh, uh, sort of seasons uh, the monsoon season when they are eating something uh, essentially gorging on food and the nesting season for which they look for particular a very very specific kind of nesting banks uh, it's very important for them to be able to travel those distances uh, because uh, that is how they live and that's the requirement and need of that species uh what really is ex situ conservation and who are the executing agencies uh well essentially uh, zoos and botanical gardens uh play this role uh 
And what they mainly work on is a lot of conservation breeding, uh, maintaining gene bank, seed bank uh, in case of floral uh, conservation. There's a huge role played uh, on the on the front of uh, education and public engagement, and of course, uh, supporting the in situ conservation. A lot of people have this uh, thought about zoos that you know they are only about keeping animals for entertainment, but that's not true. They have an immense role in public en engagement, and uh, the amount of people that a zoo can reach out to. Uh, for a particular species, like for example, gharials, we're talking about gharials here. Now, how many people can access, uh, have access to gharials in reality, in uh, you know, in its original habitat? Not many, but through zoos, uh, these uh, messages, these uh, uh, sort of engagements are possible uh, because they have such rigid uh, education policies, and uh, zoos happen to be one of the organizations which are uh, you know for for which education is one of the most important elements of its existence alongside uh, conservation breeding initiatives and a lot of other things uh, including research and management uh, but that's essentially uh ex situ conservation in a nutshell uh, one case study here that we are going to talk about is on Gharial Ecology Project. But before that, I would obviously need to uh, go through what Madras Crocodile Bank Trust does, because that's that's a strong, get more visibility and more acceptance, and people get to understand and learn more about the conservation needs of these kind of species. Uh, it also has one more uh, element to it, which I'll get to later. And of course, a lot of research that happens uh, in-house on breeding biology, uh, TSD, Gharial, uh, you know, crocs are uh, uh, essentially temperature. There's a temp there's temperature dependent sex determination uh, in uh, crocs. So it, uh, it's completely dependent on the incubation temperature, uh, whether the baby that will hatch out will be a male or a female. Now, information like that becomes extremely critical when it comes to, you know, uh, recovery uh, stage of a critically endangered species where you have to restock wild populations and you need to know what produces males, what produces females, because you have to have your conservation management plan accordingly, how many females to be released, how many males to be released and all of that. And plus maintaining the gene pool uh, very similar to a stud book of any other uh, species. A uh, uh, lot of uh, work on behaviors, on their communications, uh, all of that also happens on husbandry, how to raise them properly, how to rear them properly, what are the goods and bads of it, uh, you know, uh, a lot of discoveries uh, uh, regarding their diseases, that can, that information that can be used in uh, in situ conservation initiatives as well. Now, all this is possible in zoos and zoos are doing it. And it's just that there's a huge communication gap with uh, general public essentially where they don't get to learn the amount of work that zoos put in uh, for conservation of species. It's not just a place to display animals. It is way more than that. And there is tremendous amount of work that zoos already carry out. Uh, like, for example, here is the data of uh, Gharials released uh, between 1979 and 2007. Now, if you look at the numbers, it's over 5,000 uh, Gharials uh, from captive, either captive breeding places uh, or, uh, you know, hatching places where eggs were collected uh, from the wild, but they were incubated and hatched and the babies were reared in a captive situation and then released back into the wild. But this is a collective uh, sort of effort of what you would say is uh, an XC2 uh, sort of an organization, uh, which a zoo also is an XC2 organization. Several, several of these were also uh, uh, from uh, uh, captive populations of different zoos. Now, uh, for example, in the place that uh, uh, I, the project that I was associated with, uh, both in Kukrel and Morena, the Gharial breeding facilities are essentially zoological institutions, zoological organizations, which are dedicatedly working towards XC2 conservations. And so is MCBT. 
MCBT, like and Madras Crocodile Bank Trust, has released several hundred crocodilians, uh, gharials, muggers, and saltwater of less than a thousand animals in the wild, and a hundred of them die. Obviously, you uh, feel that you know it's a state of emergency, a state of crisis for that species, and this is the kind of response that was uh, uh, generated. And a lot of people came together to you know start figuring out what was going wrong. Uh, this is a normal gharial heart, which is very, very red, uh, full of blood. This is a heart encrusted with uric acid crystals, which is a sign of visceral gout. It's completely white in color, uh, in color and you know it's full of uric acid crystals. Also, on the in the joints, uh, these uh, gouts, uh, the the residue of uh, uric acid was found, which essentially suggest that it was extremely painful for the animals to even move their bodies uh, because all the joints essentially had deposition of these uh, uric acid and it made it very very difficult for them uh, to swim in the cold winter uh, water and a lot of them in fact uh, you know died the actual reason of death was drowning due to these conditions uh, vets also confirmed toxicosis with uh, severe kidney damage. A um, lot of healthy garials were caught uh, and their stomachs were flushed for, uh, you know, stomach contents to identify what they were eating, whether they had eaten something that was very toxic to them, to get uh, samples of fish that they have eaten and test them out for uh, uh, toxic elements and things like that. A lot of blood was collected, other joint fluid samples were taken in order to identify. Now, this is when uh, it was realized that, you know, we've been releasing all these gharials all, all these years. However, we hardly knew anything about them. There was a lack of information like no other because after the release, there was no monitoring that was done. And nobody had a clue what had happened, what this population was, uh, how much it moved, whether it was a resident population or whether they were moving around. None of that was, uh, uh, you know, uh, th there was no information about any of that. Very, very important uh, to start something on that. And uh, this is how, uh, of course, I'll talk about what happened uh, with the response, but. What I want to bring back is the linkage. Now, the crisis response team, the technical resources, the financial support, the long-term research of which the Gharial Ecology Project is a part of, the field station that was created, uh, and the stakeholder collaborations, the capacity building, all of that exclusively came because of the XC2 linkage. It was essentially zoos like MCBT and it's supporting zoos from around the world. They are the ones who actually created, uh, you know, this uh, uh, support system for uh, the Gharial crisis. The finances have been brought from different zoos. The zoos are actually uh, supporting the project in the field, right from the equipment to the salaries of the uh, field researchers uh, to the actual surveys that are being done to the capacity building that is being done everything is coming from the zoos so remember when i talked about uh, the exchange programs that are uh, happening from uh, like within india and outside now iaza like the european association of zoos and aquariums the vaza world association of zoos and aquariums they have policies where if you're uh, exhibiting critically endangered animals, uh, you must contribute to their in situ conservation. So a lot of funding has been through that program. And it is essentially the zoos that have been helping in uh, this particular conservation research initiative for over a decade now. All zoos from like Singapore to US to Europe, everywhere. And it's been tremendously supportive of uh, the different kinds of uh, initiatives that uh, we've been doing, including the education activities uh, with the local communities, everything. So there is, apart from, you know, the conservation breeding initiative that we normally talk about, it's not just that, it's way more than that. It's, it's things like uh, these that also help a lot in long-term conservation 
projects uh, like in Karyal ecology project. Uh, in fact, some some of the private animal keepers of America did a fundraiser that supported the project for a year. So it's it's not just the zoos, but anyone who has uh, uh, an interest, a strong inclination towards conservation can be part of the zoo and can be part of an ex to linkage. So we often neglect this part of uh, zoos and often, you know, completely uh, ignore this part of the zoo, but uh, it is the zoos who have kept uh, the gharials alive, the crocs alive uh, in India, and also the kind of research, the incredible research that's happening, it's all thanks to the zoos. Uh, moving on to the Karyal Ecology Project, which is an initiative by Madras Crocodile Bank Trust. Here you can see uh, the different images uh, that are found. Whoops, I think the lower bottom right image is from Nepal. Uh, that was to show the different kinds of uh, uh, tags that are now used, uh, the one with GPS. However, when I was involved in the project, uh, we were essentially going with uh, uh, the normal radio transmitters. So uh, essentially the karyals are caught uh, in the river through nets, uh, a very similar sort of uh, method that Phoebe mentioned. But because Chambal is very deep flowing river and very fast flowing river, uh, the methods are little different, but the tools are more or less the same. Uh, the Gharials, and here on the top right corner, you can see Dr. Jeff Lang, who's the principal investor of the project. In the center picture, you can also see Gauri uh, sitting right there because she was also involved in the project. And of course, Rom, Rom Whitaker, who has been an incredible support in all this uh, alongside MCBT and as Rom himself. Now, these are the kind of linkages that we also need. It's not just one or two stakeholders, everyone from the local communities, to the researchers, to the influencers, uh, people, you know, who can talk about uh, such concerns and people listen. It's very important to have them on board as well. Uh, now, all of this, what you can see here, has been made possible because of a very, very strong zoo component. In fact, it is almost exclusively possible because of a strong zoo component, because Everyone from like in the picture in the middle, you can see uh, the director of uh, Prague Zoo from Czech, Czech Republic. And uh, they were, uh, you know, they've been one of the largest contributors to the project, uh, sustaining the project for a long, long, long time. Uh, I would like to show you a, a short clip, a video clip that will give you a very, very good idea on the project. Uh, Chumbal and uh, let me quickly show you uh, just um, if you can see the uh, video, please. Uh, Dr. Devender, is this visible? Certainly see Certainly. it. The yes, sir. All yes, right. sir. Busy one. Busy one. Okay. Tremendous die off of Gario here on the Chumbo River. More than 100 animals died within a very short period of time. We didn't know what was happening. And the government of India reacted and said, well, we need research. We need to find out what's going on. And the only way we can unravel the secrets of Gario, find out why something so tragic happened, is to get right into their lives, into their private lives, by using radio telemetry. In order to really learn uh, the day, what the animals are doing day to day, we really have to track individual animals. And the best way to do that is to use small radios, which we attach to the animals at the base of the tail. And uh, it allows us to tell where an individual animal is. Each radio has its own signature, its own frequency. And so we can actually follow individual animals. Uh, we have to catch them, first of all, and Gariel unlike most other crocodilians, uh, can't be uh, baited. You can't get them to come into traps. You have to actually net them. So we are using uh, local people who are skilled in netting. When we actually catch the animal in the net, we usually secure its mouth, we band it. So these animals are really powerful, so they, they present some real challenges in terms of handling, and they're also big. 
the radio is actually attached by threading some fishing line just below the skews. And actually during the whole process, the animals are very docile. They tend not to thrash around. And then once we get them near the water and remove the band, they almost seem like they're coming alive, like they've almost been asleep. And, and usually they make that mad dash in the water and disappear underwater. But we have a tag so we can follow. Those individual animals really tell us what the whole population is doing. We found uh, animals based on the last five years of study here that uh, are actually moving 100 plus kilometers every season. So the gharials move down during the monsoon, or the adults anyway, and, and they move back uh, upstream. Uh, to the same areas year year after year, and so there. So one animal is using a big stretch of river, which is potentially really important because uh, if you're going to keep that animal in the system, it has to have that whole river so that it can move up and down. The behaviors that we're finding out, thanks to using radio telemetry, are, are we're revealing secrets of the girl that we just never imagined before. There are behaviors, for example, of male gharials looking after creches of a thousand babies at a time and keeping everybody else away, including other gharials, in order to protect them. This is the kind of thing that we didn't imagine before. These are behaviors that have been uh, shown and, and demonstrated so beautifully in primates, in elephants, other animals. But uh, we're suddenly realizing that uh, crocodilians, and especially the gharial, have fantastically complex behaviors of their own and an intelligence we had not revealed before. Gharials are very specialized fish eaters, so they pose very little threat to, to, to humans. And they're living with humans in this environment in the in the Chambo. Every day people are coming down to the water and, and gharials really don't represent the sort of threat that saltwater crocodiles, for instance, represent. Um, this is probably the, the last place where gharials are, are actually living in, a, in a, a free open river, a dynamic river. It's extremely important that, that the system stay intact uh, in order to maintain not only the natural world, but also people living in the natural world. All right. Uh, so essentially, sorry. Okay. Uh, so the doc, the film that you saw was also made by a zoo uh, uh, in in America. So it's, what I am trying to say here now is, it's very important to understand the different stakeholders when we talk about uh, wildlife conservation and zoos play the biggest role as an ex to conservation uh, agency, which can, uh, you know, contribute immensely uh, with the right kind of uh, direction. And it has been doing incredible work like you, what, for example, it is almost exclusively the in situ conservation has been hand in hand with the XE2 component, but uh, zoos essentially Hello. have been the driving force uh, for this. So uh, this goes true for any and every wildlife uh, that we come across and zoos that partake and participate in uh, conservation initiatives. Uh, so it's, it's very, very important to understand that uh, zoos are much more than places of exhibition for animals. Uh, they play a huge role in education, a huge role in uh, community engagement, and also a very, very big role in uh, uh, XC2, as an XC2 conservation agency, supporting the actual in habitat or in original habitat uh, conservation projects. Uh, so with that, I would like to conclude. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Soham, uh, for the wonderful talk. For me, a trip down memory lane and 
for reiterating strongly the role that zoos can play in the in-situ conservation. Um, I don't think we have any questions now, but everybody seems to have enjoyed the talk very much and have asked uh, where they could see it again. So uh, it will be available on the YouTube channel. I have shared the link with everyone. There is an opportunity now to ask any questions. If anybody has anything, both our speakers are available. Um, if anybody has any questions, they can send it to us in the chat box on the right hand bottom corner of the screen. Well, no questions here yet. Thank you, Soham. Thank you, Phoebe. Thank you very much for doing this. And uh, I'm certain it has inspired a lot more people to visit the Chambal and Nepal. At least me. I'm going to come there and visit you guys when I, when I can. Thank you very, very much for uh, giving us the time and doing this talk today. Thank you, Gauri. And uh, to anyone who's listening, especially the young kids, Please try to look for uh, the uh, volunteer programs in zoos. You can learn amazing things, be part of, uh, you know, good programs. And of course, if you are inspiring uh, to be uh, uh, a zoologist, a wildlife biologist, a conservationist, this is an absolutely amazing place to start. So do go uh, to your zoos and explore the volunteer uh, programs for sure. I think we have a couple of questions coming through on the chat. What are the questions? Um, shall I, I might take the first one, which is what is yes, the difference yes. between a uh, mugger and a gurriel? Um, so in terms of sort of visually, um, the muggers obviously have this kind of shorter, fatter head, um, and that reflects that they have a more diverse diet. So as well as eating fish, they'll take different animals um, from the side of the river, um, including larger animals, whereas the gurriel's long, thin snout is being specially adapted um, to um, mostly eating just aquatic creatures. Uh, but from an evolutionary perspective, um, they're actually not that closely related. So um, they split from each other many millions of years ago. And in fact, they're only as closely related to each other as we humans are to lemurs. Um, so it's a really big sort of evolutionary distance. Um, but because all crocs have this similar lifestyle of living in the rivers, they all look a little bit similar. Thank you, Phoebe. So, um, will you take the next question? Uh, basically, they're asking how, as citizens, uh, crocodiles and uh, gharials can be conserved in the wild. Uh, yes. Well, if you're living, uh, if you're not living in a place where uh, you have gharials, then obviously there are not going to be things that you can do directly to, you know, help and conserve uh, the species. However, uh being you know the the challenges that the gharials are facing in the wild are essentially somewhere happening because uh, we are contributing to it like for example uh the sand mining that's happening because we want development everywhere uh we want more power so there are more uh, uh industries coming up uh we want we are demanding as as a population we are demanding so many things uh, for our own convenience. So it's not going to uh, be one person's act in a day going to solve uh, everything. But uh, what you can do is you can be, uh, you can take informed decisions about your lifestyle, uh, what you need, what you don't need, uh, inspire others, get others involved, participate in, uh, you know, such activities where you can uh build your own information base and you know pass it on and that's one of the ways that you can definitely uh, raise a voice against uh, uh everything that is going wrong uh in the garial habitat because essentially every change that is happening every uh sort of destruction that is happening in the habitat is somewhere linked to us and we are contributing to all of that and it's not just about garials it's about any other wild animal 
this is how it happens. Uh, if you're demanding more things, more resources, as population, and I know it's very difficult to, you know, sort of relate to uh, it on a personal basis, but uh, trust me, we as a population are doing everything wrong that can happen. So just be informed and make informed decisions. And eventually, if there are more like you, uh, we'll have a much better chance for Garyals in future. Thank you very much for this, Soham. And I think we'll end the session here. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for taking the time to join us today. And uh, there's another session tomorrow. And we hope to see you all join the web uh, YouTube link uh, tomorrow. Thank you, and have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gauri. Thank you, CZA, for